These are examples that stories that you could be telling within your own office. Um, right. So for, for mine in particular, I don't know if you've ever heard of this, um, but it's called the Friendly Floaties. Have you ever heard of this? No. Just like off the day. You never heard of that phrase. Okay. So have you ever mm. wondered what happens to a container if it falls off of a cargo ship? Yes, because I lost uh, um, I lost some Ivy Park merchandise from a, a ship that lost uh, containers. I never got my socks. So, oh my God. Uh, yeah. so basically, Beyonce has like a bunch of stuff at the bottom of the ocean. Or maybe not. Are you telling me that it's somewhere? Well, it depends on the product that was actually being shipped because the overwhelming majority, and I'll, I'll play this clip here in just a second, but the overwhelming majority of freight, when it falls off of one, you know, maybe weather patterns or, you know, rough seas, obviously weather affects the, the rough seas. Um, so what happens is these containers will fall off and it just becomes a either a salvage situation where you can claim salvage rights or it becomes a situation where they're just going to immediately like be uh, at the bottom of the ocean. Um, mm -hmm. So let me play this quick clip because this particular freight that got lost um, was pretty buoyant. And so it hung around for a little while. Let me, let me play the clip. Cargo. Think about it. A container with two cars inside will obviously sink when it floods, while the same container filled with bath toys will instead stay afloat. This is actually what happened in 1992 when the Ever Laurel lost some of her containers in a storm while on passage between Asia and the USA. One container that went over had over 28,000 bath toys inside, meaning that even when the container flooded, it would still remain afloat because the toys would display so much water, generating enough buoyancy for themselves and the steel container. Of course, we know that for whatever reason the toys got out, so that container will have sunk while the toys spent the next few decades riding the ocean currents, giving scientists an unexpected insight into ocean flow patterns worldwide. Anyway, the point is, the only way for a container to remain afloat for a prolonged period is for it to contain cargo that is sufficiently buoyant, and for that cargo to remain secure enough that it doesn't get out. So how, okay, so I, I'll oh, set that crazy. up, a, you know, a little bit more, but that's essentially what happens. It depends on the cargo that is actually uh, being shipped. And so this particular incident is called the Friendly Floaties Spill. And it was a bunch of bath toys, like not bath toys, but like rubber duckies, um, some yeah. other bath, you know, type animals that have a similar like buoyancy level to it. And because of this situation that all of these rubber duckies, literally 28,000 of these rubber duckies were released into the ocean. We're still finding them to this day. This happened in 1994, I believe is what the video said. Um, but, but we learned so much about ocean currents from this spill because the, there was this doctor that like, or this um, professor that like studied where all of these rubber duckies were ending up. And some of them were ending up in, you know, the Australian coastline. Um, we, we figured out that to go through one full ocean current cycle takes one year. If you, for, so these duckies, they were still washing up a year later um, in, in massive. I mean, there was 28,000 of them. So they were ending up in all areas of, of the world. And what I thought was really cool is that for a lot of us that we didn't understand, especially those who work in ocean shipping, they didn't understand a lot of how these ocean currents work and what we, we don't know what we don't know. Right. And, and so yeah. for some of these companies, especially how trade lanes are established. So trade lanes, meaning what route is your ship going to take from one country's port to another port? What's the most efficient way to do that where you can kind of ride the currents and get there more efficiently, um, you know, avoid the bad weather it's very very like yeah. booking a ship is very similar to booking a truck and i don't know why that blew my mind when i found out about it i just assumed like you book the the ship and it takes the the quickest point you know from port to port that's yeah. not the case they use different ocean currents and because of that situation um they were able to find and establish new trade lanes based Whoa. on the uh, on how the little rubber duckies like ended up all over the place and um i thought that that was so cool and another cool part of this is that it what? was turned into a children's book. Um, so it's called what? A Ducky. I, I ordered this yesterday, so it actually should get here. Too. I was hoping it would get here in time, but it hasn't gotten here yet. Um, but I will let me share this little uh, book. And it is so cute. Or it oh, my God. You know, who, 
you should send that to Lauren Began. She just had a baby too, and she oh, loves their okay. time. Oh Isn't my this God. cute? And so it got me thinking, like, how are we teaching kids about the supply oh chain? Like, if you're if you're just listening to this, it's like a, the cutest little rubber duck that's on the cover of it. It's called Ducky. And uh, one of the intro pages says, I am a yellow plastic duck and I am in great danger. Yesterday, I was snuggled safe with <laughs> hundreds of other bathtub toys. We were in a crate on a big ship. A storm came and our crate was washed overboard. So it shows a little picture of like a wet you know, uh, a so duck cute. that is obviously scared and all of the different things that you learn from this. And so I thought that that was, it was, it was one of those stories that I was like, Oh, Beautiful this is art. such a cool video. And let me, um, really quick, that video that we just listened to came from casual navigation on YouTube. That it's a great follow for, you know, sort of, you know, casual navigation stories. Um, but I thought that that was it, when I, I saw that video and I was looking up on Wikipedia on how the story sort of evolved and every, all of the insights that came from learning about the ocean shipping patterns and things like that. Um, and learning where these different, uh, where I guess salvage rights and, and we yes, could spend probably an right? entire show on, on salvage law. rights. Yes. <laughs> it's just so like, ancient and fascinating. Yeah. And um, there was this other video that I did want to show too, because that's really like the cute side of it. So the, you know, the children's book came out of it, but then on the other side uh, is where I wanted to loop it back around to cargo crime, because some of these floating containers just end up in the middle of the sea and, or middle of the ocean. And it causes danger for some of like maybe sailboats, for example, because only part of the container is kind of sticking up out of the water an and you don't have time to maneuver around it. Um, yeah. So if it hasn't sunk yet, depending on the product that it's carrying, it might remain buoyant for, you know, longer than you would imagine. But then there was another incident where, and I'll share this tab here, um, of these other folks that uh, stumbled upon these merchant, I think, fishermen that stumbled upon a container that was floating in the middle of the ocean and uh, it had cigarettes in it. Oh, so, hell yes. <laughs> so all of the merchants, they cut Oh, my God. A container that's floating in the middle of the ocean. And so they start ripping out all of the cigarettes um, from Look the ship. Them. So obviously, you probably see that if you're a fisherman and you're like, oh, well, what's in here? Salvage rights, technically, you can seize that. You can uh, lay claim uh, as long as nobody else is laying claim, like ownership wise, which if you think about it, I'm sure, you know, the insurance companies maybe saw this video um, and maybe had something to say about this process. Um, but it was it, I thought it was a really cool case of like, OK, this is what happens when it's stuff that people actually want, that they're going to find a way or just. Oh, and, hell yeah that they're going to try to find out how, what's inside of there and see if it's worth anything. And I'm sure for a lot of these guys on the boat, um, finding a lot of those cigarettes, boxes and boxes, it was estimated to be millions of dollars in cargo um, worth of cigarettes. Oh, my God. Especially depending on what country they're from, like even if they have that type. Oh, that's so cool. Oh, oh those guys. Oh, those guys just are like generational wealth. Like we just hit the <laughs> jackpot. And uh, while, you know, what, one last quick thing, because I, I, I know you got to go, but there's another incident of a, this is such an insane story because it led me down this rabbit hole of, okay, like oh, salvage rights. Well, what technically is salvage rights and, and, you know, what can come from these types of different conversations. And so for this other example, have you ever, it's wild because there's an example of a person that, um, or a British pilot, he ran into some trouble. He had about a minute of fuel left in his, in his plane. He had to do an emergency landing. And the closest thing around him was a cargo ship. He had to land the jet on top of the containers on a floating cargo ship in order to not die. Um, so he was a British pilot. He landed on a Spanish or a, a cargo plane or a cargo uh -oh. ship from Spain. So Spain ends up claiming salvage mm -hmm. rights on the jet. And then they're able to get uh, get the British to pay to get the jet back. And it's, it's wild because obviously you're in the middle of the ocean. It's a little bit slippery. So this plane is, uh, it covers, it, once it lands on top of the, the containers, then it, they hit some waves and it falls back and hits a van that's on top of the cargo ship. And so let me play this video because it's wild that this uh, reporter is doing a story in front of this. So let me, I'll pull this up on the screen now. 
Um, That's crazy. Okay, here we go. In the end, it's been a story of mixed fortune. Oh. Lieutenant Watson, warming up for his first major NATO exercise, he suddenly finds himself in the headlines and four days adrift from his Harrier squadron. For the way in which he skillfully managed to land on this crowded wow. cargo deck, there was much praise and much relief. But the worrying question remains, exactly how did he find himself in such a dire situation in the first place? So, Lieutenant Watson's fate is still not certain. But as a party of British naval engineers and mechanics got to work, attaching lifting gear onto the Harrier, <laughs> clear that no action would be taken until a naval board of inquiry has investigated the affair. The Harrier will be taken back to the United Kingdom after being loaded onto a British tanker, which is expected in Tenerife tomorrow afternoon. Isn't that wow. insane? <laughs> so crazy. And then it's just so nuts that like, yeah, it's not technically owned by them at that point either. Interesting. And and that's yeah. what ended up happening with the How case. How did he land the, like that? I, I guess like the, the, the jet propulsion that he could just land straight oh, down like, like a helicopter. Because um, yeah. that was my first question too. Is like, how the hell do you land on a cargo ship? Because I've I've been on uh, a naval carrier before and they have the yes. area where you can land and take off. But to land straight down obviously takes a lot of skill. And apparently that pilot had only completed about 75% of his training. Um, uh, so yeah. I <laughs> that, that's saying, a that's like good 18 pilot. years old yeah geez <laughs> wow that's incredible so that that that's was uh that, that's why i brought it back to the cargo crimes is that spain um basically found themselves in the hands of a british jet and <laughs> uh made the brits pay for to have it back <laughs> um which is probably one of the few ways that you can get the brits to give things back nowadays um yeah just deal yeah exactly. <laughs> yeah just have a salvage rights. So if any yeah. uh, museum, especially like Egypt or anybody else that's looking uh, to get some of your stuff back, maybe try salvage rights because yeah. they, they the, the Brits do listen when it comes to that. That's so funny. <laughs>